I think most of you know who I am, but I'm, for those of you who don't, I'm a faculty member in um, curriculum teaching and learning, and my area of research is um, broadly sort of educational technology and, and learning. So um, I'm very happy to introduce our panel today, and I'm going to leave space so you can actually see them, and just tell you a little bit about each person first. Um, starting with uh, Steve Ehrlich, who has over 25 years experience practicing law within the music and film industries. And he was the VP of legal and business affairs at two major record companies, uh, M, sorry, BMG Music Canada and EMI Music Canada. And Stephen's currently an assistant professor at Ryerson at the uh, School of Media, where he teaches undergraduate and graduate courses in business, law, media writing, sports theory, research methods, and media studies. My goodness. <laughs> Congratulations. That's, that's a lot of, that's a real variety. Um, in addition to his law degree, Stephen holds a Master of Arts uh, degree in media production from Ryerson and is currently enrolled in a PhD program here at OISE. Um, and next to him is Ramona Pringle, and she is an inter interactive producer, researcher, and assistant professor in the RTA School of Media at Ryerson, and her work examines the evolving re relationships between humans and technology. Most recently, she produced Avatar Secrets, an interactive documentary for the iPad with TVO. Ramona is also the creative director of Ryerson's Transmedia Zone, an academic incubator for the future of content and narrative. And then we move on to our OISE people who are clustered together, starting with Jim Hewitt, who is the associate chair in CTL and the coordinator of the MT program. And his research interests focus on the educational applications of computer-based technologies with a particular emphasis on discursive processes in um, collaborative learning environments. And Jim's the developer of an online educational environment called Pepper that many of you use here, a web-based collaborative workspace that supports learners of all ages in their efforts to share information, identify key ideas, and progressively work to improve those ideas. And next to him is Alexandra. And um, she's a PhD candidate here, and she's asking the research question, what can online education learn from social media? And her research focuses on the use of the like button um, as a social scaffolding tool to stimulate conversation in discussion-based online courses. And she also does a lot of work with, with faculty in, and um, in other contexts designing online courses of all different kinds. And finally, last but not least, is Leslie. Leslie Wilton is an instructor of integrating technology into the classroom in our Masters of Teaching program here at OISE. And she's a doctoral candidate in CTL and an elementary teacher with the Peel District School Board. Her areas of research um, are online learning, literacy, and teaching with technology. And she's, unlike some of us, is very active on Twitter. OK. <laughs> All right, so um, should we go around in the, to do our little sort of two-minute introductions first, or not introductions, but your little um, summary? We might as well go in the order that we began. Okay, so. Two minutes? I thought well, no, it's not really two minutes. I'm limiting you already. Five. I think you have a full five minutes. Okay. Yeah, Hi, everyone. Um, to remind you, I'm Stephen Ehrlich. Uh, I guess I was brought into this discussion because of my work uh, on a paper I did uh, where I examined digital distraction in the classroom and how to turn smart devices into pedagogical tools. Um, disclaimer, I do come from the RTA School of Media, as does Ramona, so we might be more inclined uh, and accepting of uh, technology in the classroom. However, we do have colleagues who completely resist it, so this isn't a uh, a Ryerson policy. Um, for me, you know, having a, a constructivist phys philosophical outlook to how I teach, um, if I walk into a classroom full of what are now digital natives, uh, like the digital immigrants have moved through the system, maybe they're in grad school still, but if I have to kind of 
acknowledge and accept the way that they learn, the way they incorporate information, and also acknowledge that I'm not the only authority in the room. That information, as, as uh, Professor Michael Weston from Kansas State University, in, in a, a video I watched of uh, his lecture, I'm not the sole authority in the room. The internet is in the room. All the information, practically in the entire world, is in the room. So I'm not the sole authority. And um, information is not scarce. So I try to incorporate the fact that they're quick with their, their uh, digital devices. And if I keep them engaged and with that sort of constructivist viewpoint of we can build knowledge together, they're too busy with what I'm having them do. Even in my mass lectures, which for me is anything over 100, I have them engaged and I'm using through my PhD work certain programs and, and um, knowledge building knowledge community that even in a class of 200, I'm breaking people up into groups and, and having them construct and build knowledge together. And a lot of that is based on them doing research instantly, deep content research, you know, maybe not for the length of time that they really require to do deep, deep research, but I give them work and, and activities and, and things to do. That, that requires them to have access to the internet. So I'll say, I have a lot more to say about it, but I think I'll pass the microphone, thanks. Uh, well, so an interesting follow-up because uh, I'm also in the School of Media and I, I think um, the right place to start is to give you guys a, a sense of some of the classes that I, I teach. So I have taught the Introduction to Digital Media course for the media students where they are all on Twitter as part of the course and they are all engaging on Twitter as part of the course. Um, I teach Interaction Design for the Masters of Digital Media where they're looking at processes and systems and the theory of how we communicate but also the systems that we design and how you make an engaging interactive experience. I teach interactive narratives and multi-platform storytelling. Uh, and I teach sort of an overview creative processes class. So some of them are 12 people in my classes. And with the most recent uh, creative processes class, there was 330 students from media production, new media, and sport media. So it's a, those are very different experiences. And how you integrate technology into those different classes is a very, very, very different beast. Um, I don't love having technology in my class. I have to say, uh, I... And I, and I say that for a couple, for a couple of reasons. Um, I am a huge proponent of the collaborative experience, and I think a lot of the time our collaborative tools uh, inhibit the collaborative experience when you're in person. Um, I, the great challenge comes about, and the reason that I wanted to tell you guys the names of some of my courses is that I need them to have their computers open sometimes, and sometimes that kind of like, uh, more like aerobics exercise of like computers open, computers closed, computers open, computers closed, and even just sort of my own dealing with my own kind of coming of age as a professor and, and the relationship with students and wanting to, it's hard to always say, put away your phone, put away this device, put away that device. Um, but I, and so, so some of the strategies that I work with um, really work to combat that idea that, you know, they are there. Uh, I don't like distractions, but I know um, in a lot of the fields of sort of interaction design and interactive making, where really what people see and what we've learned from the internet, when we've, what we've learned from these collaborative online spaces is the power of co-thinking, is the power of creating things online. But we'll see more and more, or less and less and less of the computer lab because we don't need those you know, big technologies. That people don't need the, that infrastructure. But what we can give our students is this opportunity to work together, is the opportunity to be paired together. So I think kind of thinking through the benefits that we get from technology, but actually applying that to the real world experience. Sort of like how room escapes have grown out of video games, but are these live experiences, I think, learning from the digital experience, but having a, an analog experience that mirrors that so that we actually can connect has been powerful. I mean, I also used Google Docs and stuff like that in the classroom. Um, so that's the perspective that I, that I bring. Great. Uh, actually, I should probably use a different sure. microphone. Uh, yeah. Oh, that's right. Yes. Yeah, that one's got a limited cord. Hi, I'm Jim Hewitt. Um, yeah, social media is, is huge, right? And uh, a lot of our students come to uh, our courses, uh, experienced users of social media and wanting to use social media. So there's um, uh, a lot of people who have been thinking about different ways that different social medias can be incorporated into, into teaching and learning. Uh, my personal perspective is uh, I, I think it offers a lot of power, but, uh, but we also have to be cautious. 
We, we know that there are problems with certain social media. We, uh, last year, there was a, a study released from the University of uh, Michigan, I believe, by Kroos, talking about an association between Facebook and depression. It appears that people who are on Facebook more tend to be more depressed, and they, they attribute this to this phenomena of social comparison, whereby people see the wonderful things that other people are doing on Facebook, and they're wondering, why aren't I having a great time, too, in my life? Um, they've, um, we've heard problems about bullying online. We've heard problems about Facebook being a distraction and distracting kids from doing work. Uh, we've heard just about this whole problem of, of kids feeling that they have to cultivate an impression online. It's called impression management that makes them look a certain way to their friends and their peers and their family. So in a lot of ways, you know, these, these types of things put a lot of pressures on our, on our kids. And so, not, not to mention, of course, the advertising, of course, that goes along in some of these environments. So I think we have to be careful about how we use these environments. But on the other hand, they do do some really cool stuff. And what they do do is they, they give you, uh, they give us an, uh, a place where people can go and feel like they're part of a community, where people can go and share materials, exchange things, uh, where they can interact with people that they may not have immediate access to every day. So there's a lot of good things about social media as well as some of these, these problems. So as a, as a researcher in educational technology, uh, my interest is how can we capitalize on these good things, identify the real strengths, and use those in educationally powerful ways. So my, my philosophy is not one of actually using Facebook or Twitter or, or these other types of software, but figuring out what is the essence of what makes them good educationally and how can we incorporate those into educational environments of our own design. And this is a really important challenge because in online education, um, there are a lot of problems that are social related. People drop out of online courses quite a lot because they don't feel that, that kind of cohesion with their classmates or with their instructor. <coughs> Uh, online classes have traditionally had very high dropout rates. So how can we use some of the strengths of social media and, and change our online environment, our online learning environments, to take advantage of those strengths? Um, one way to break down some of those strengths and start to understand them, there was a, a researcher at Simon Fraser, his name is Kitzman, who actually broke them down into seven categories. Social media offers presence, so you know, knowing other people are there, sharing of materials and other things, conversations, relationships, identity, reputation, and groups, being able to group people. And so what, what our research team does, one of the things our research team does, is we, we look at these different types of things and figure out what are the strong things that social media brings that we might be able to use in our own online learning software. So for example, Impression management and the buildup of one's identity is not something we necessarily want to have in there. But we do want to have in there the ability for people to quickly interact with individuals, either privately or publicly or with a group, to be able to create groups spontaneously, to be able to acknowledge other people and, uh, and have people uh, recognized for the, uh, the good ideas they've done. So again, that's what we're trying to do is strategically figure out what the strengths are of, of uh, social media and use them to our advantage. Okay, thanks, Jim. Alexandra. Thank you. So to follow up, I think, on everyone's thoughts, um, how I think about social media and what role I believe it plays in education, whether it be face-to-face -face education um, or online education, is that social media has offered us a new way to communicate with each other. And this ability to communicate on the fly, you almost everyone has a smartphone that they can engage with some other individual um, through social media. They, it teaches a new type of skill. It teaches us a new way to interact with people that we might not interact with regularly, or it allows us to have a back channel conversation with people who we do see regularly. So it's this fine balance of how do we and what do we communicate and what do we learn from this new form of technology? And where I believe the strengths are in looking at social media 
is in understanding their affordances. So like Jim was speaking to, um, what is it that on Facebook makes people compared to sh uh, share information? Why are you sharing a particular YouTube video through Facebook? Why not share it through YouTube itself? Um, it's understanding how people negotiate these ideas and where their thought lies in communicating in these specific, um, with, with these specific modes of uh, social media. So we look at affordances of Facebook. We know that we can share things easily. People can engage in things very quickly using the like button. It's a low cost mechanism. That's what I'm studying specifically. And how does that relate to how we learn? How does that relate to how we engage with others? And I believe there's something that social media does which we don't easily do face to face. It's we trust people. Um, because we, people have curated their own profiles, you can look at what people have done in their past through browsing their, their profile by lurking, um, seeing what people are all about in this online world. Yes, they've created it, and yes, there are concerns about privacy, so what am I releasing into this cyber space that is clearly endless? Um, but what value does that have for other people in understanding who I am? And how does that then help me interact with these other individuals? So we look at other types of social media like Instagram and Twitter, and we think to ourselves, is there a way these types of interactions that each of these social media offer, which are unique, um, can they be leveraged in education? And my answer to well, what I, how I begin to answer this question is, I think if you look at and design very specific educational experiences um, with these types of social media in mind, then you can absolutely leverage it to whatever um, point you feel like as an instructor, as a student. Um, one of the, the things I think about Instagram, it's so unique. You can tag absolutely any picture with a series of hashtags and that is searchable. So what value does that have in learning? And I think about for high school students or for even students in um, undergraduate science classes, they can take pictures of their labs, they can take pictures and share these different types of um, resources with peers. That never happened before. We didn't have that ability to communicate these types of things that actually make people feel like they are a part of a larger community when you are in undergraduate, you might feel like you are alone. You only have a core group of friends and that's not enough. And so there's a bigger world out there. So it's understanding how to tap into that world and how to tap into that responsibly and understanding what you're sh sharing has an impact on how people perceive you, how people interact with you and how that becomes valuable to your larger experience. So there, are, I feel like there are more answers, uh, more questions than there are answers, but I think that looking at the particular affordances of different types of social media, we can begin to understand and leverage what they have to offer for education. Okay, thanks Alexandra. Leslie. Okay, hi, I'm Leslie Wilton, and uh, my perspective is similar and, and just a little bit different because um, as a pre-service educator, I think about integrating social media and education all the time. Uh, it's, a, it's an important component of our classroom discussions that we have uh, regularly. And um, I think it's, there is no clear picture that I've found on how to prepare uh, new teachers for uh, teaching about social media and also integrating it into their classroom. We're, we're uh, new teachers are, well, teachers are in the K-12 space are governed by a number of bodies. I'm, I'm governed by ETFO, uh, OCT, and also my school board. And uh, each of those uh, bodies have a perspective on teaching with social media. So it's, it's a messy and complex issue to think about uh, as a teacher. Um, uh, it, the, I think about what is expected of us professionally, and it changes because there there are updates every two or three years advising teachers 
how what to watch for, what to be cautious about. And uh, there's also stories frequently that talk about the benefits of uh, integrating social media into uh, into your teaching. Um, I think what I'm seeing sometimes in the pre-service program uh, is surprise uh, from the students when they uh, discover their online identity and um, they realize how uh, how much information there is about each of them online. And that's something that they were never taught about uh, in school when they were in the K-12 space. <clears throat> the other thing that's uh, that's a struggle is, as uh, Stephen mentioned, di the digital native, div digital immigrant assumptions that um, the new uh, pre-service students have grown up with technology. So because they've grown up with it and they, they use it all the time, they will know how to teach with that technology. They'll know how to teach through social media. But in fact, uh, scholars like uh, uh, Deborah Britzman have uh, done studies and they've discovered that oftentimes we teach the way we were taught. And most of us, uh, even uh, the pre-service students who, have, uh, who are in their early 20s, have typically not learned using uh, technology. So um, it's, it's not so simple and it's not uh, so easy to integrate social media into teaching. And when I think about it from a student's perspective, as a, as a teacher, what's the best way to teach with social media to teach our students? There are there are many issues which have been mentioned already: um, access, appropriate use, privacy. Um, the new uh, Bachelor of Education guidelines uh, mention 21st century learning, and they mention the importance of being able to teach with technology. Uh, but how do we how do we do that? What does 21st century learning look like? How do we um, deal with so social media uh, that continues to be developed? We we don't even know what social media we'll be dealing with in five years. Um, when do we start to teach students how to use these tools responsibly? Uh, I follow Roy and Lee, a TDSB middle school teacher who writes a blog called the Spicy Learning Blog, and he often laments that by the time he, his students come into middle school, they, they're they very tech savvy generally, they are very comfortable using technology, but they use it for social purposes and not for learning. And he would really like to see us start teaching students right in kindergarten that uh, technology, social media can be a very powerful learning tool. And um, so one of the things we talk about in my class is uh, developing contracts with the students. What is social, uh, what is responsible social media use? What uh, what should we do and not do with social media right in, in a grade one or two classroom so that students learn very early on that their uh, online profile can be, become public. They learn early on what might tend to, to come, uh, to sound like it's cyberbullying uh, how to communicate, uh, as some people refer to in a 21st century fashion, online, so that uh, the intentions are clearly communicated and meaning can't be misconstrued without the uh, like visual cues that we're used to uh, reading when we're having face-to-face -face conversations. Um, so uh, anyways, I... I could go on, uh, but my last question, because uh, I have more questions than answers like, uh, like many others, uh, is uh, even when Alexandra was talking about uh, hashtags and keywords, how, how do we teach our students to learn about those? There's, there's no real rule about what keywords you should be using, what hashtags should you be looking for when you're studying space, for example. And so how do we teach what those are? How do we, how do the students learn them? And is that a new literacy that we need to think about for our 21st century learners? So anyways. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I suspect it is a new literacy. <laughs> Um, has anybody got a burning question right off hand or a comment that they'd like to make? Um, if you do, could you go and use the mic there so that we can get it, you know, we can record it? Somebody, courageous person, want to go up and ask a question? All right, while you're thinking about it, 
I will ask a question. <laughs> um, just generally, but you know, for the panel, um, do you think you can be a good teacher using teacher of technology use if you're not already in a, a user of it in in a in a meaningful way in your own life? <clears throat> so I don't just mean that you know how to use it, but that it, it that it isn't already an integral part of how you kind of learn and navigate the world. So I just wanted what your thoughts were about that. Anybody who fancies responding? Well, why don't we just go? Yeah. <clears throat> you bring up a really good question there because it's one thing to talk to faculty and say, you should be using Twitter more, you should be on Facebook more. I think just like you walk into the classroom because of your area of expertise, um, I walk into the business of music because I've been a lawyer for 30 years, but that doesn't mean I can all of a sudden start giving Twitter bonus points because that's something I heard another prof is doing. So you do have to be able to walk the walk um, because you know their bull detector is going to go off when you say, we're going to do Twitter bonus points and, and they know that you don't even have a you know, Twitter handle. Um, so you, and I think it's um, unfair to expect faculty to adopt these, these social media platforms if they don't use them. I was a very early adopter on Facebook. So I was on Facebook when you needed a, Ry or a Ryerson or any university address to get on. I haven't been on Facebook for five years. I just don't like Facebook. Um, so I don't get to like anybody. Um, so I don't use it. But I use Twitter daily. So I do use Twitter, in, in, but again, when it's appropriate to the course. At first I was just using it, and then I realized, God, that didn't work. Uh, so, you do, like I said, you have to be able to walk the walk, and it has to fit into the pedagogical design of your course. Again, if you're, you're just trying to push a square peg through a round hole just because it's cool, and I think that's another danger and something I, I talked about in the paper I referenced, is that sometimes we want to just seem cool to our students and that it, it you know who doesn't want to be you know the cool professor um well maybe some of us don't i know i do um, but that's not a good reason to enter into those this domain so i think if it makes sense to the curriculum that you're teaching to the to the pedagogy that you've adopted if you understand the technology and your students will benefit that you will incrementally increase um, their ability to learn, to gather knowledge, to work with each other, whether, you know, I've, I've gotten in trouble with CCS, which is our IT department, not trouble, but like I crashed the system because I have 185 students on a Google Doc editing at the same time. It was really fun um, and sorry, but it crashed. Uh, but that way they're engaged and it was just a simple question, you know, what kinds of things do we research in media? And, you know, it's like drama, documentaries, history, you know, and the thing crashed. But it was, it was fun to watch them all working and, 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 and just that instant real-time uh, input. So if, if it's right and appropriate and you understand it, then it's great. And if it isn't, maybe, you know, just lecture. Okay. Yeah. Anyone? Do you want to jump in there? Sure. Um, I was echoing some of Stephen's, uh, uh, some of his thoughts there. So there are a lot of subtle nuances that if you do not, if you are not a seasoned user of a particular social media, that if you are designing and you are purposefully integrating into your course um, and making your students engage with this use of social media, you may not understand the different concerns that come up. So one of the things that I'm doing in instructional design is I like to teach students how to use YouTube, how to create videos, how to create screencasts, and Jim and I did this in a course um, last term. And there are things you need to know. You need to know that some students are not comfortable putting their face on YouTube. So there are things about YouTube, marking them as unlisted videos, and then opting to allow them to just provide a screencast with an audio overlay rather than showing their face. There are all these little things that add up um, when you 
are teaching with and integrating into your lessons and these learning experiences that make a big difference to students. And that dramatically impacts the way they react to and that the way they even come out of the experience saying, you know, I truly loved this assignment because you gave us the options. You knew. It's not that, oh, I just decided let's use YouTube. It's cool. Um, everyone's using it. It's a thoughtful process and it's absolutely deliberate in understanding these privacy concerns, which everybody has, not many people speak about necessarily um, in education, uh, in a lot, in a, sorry, in higher education uh, necessarily, because that's where a lot of um, these students, they are digital natives. They, they consume it every day. So that is a nuance that needs to be purposefully thought out in your design and execution. Okay, thanks. Did you? I, I think that there's another piece too. I think that you're both right. Um, but when it comes to our personal use before bringing it into the classroom, the thing about technology is that, and this probably doesn't apply to anyone in this room, but it, this is a small room. Uh, technology always comes with a culture of fear. We're fearful of what we don't understand. Um, but all technology comes with promise and peril. And the only way that you figure out the sort of um, the, that ecosystem or the boundaries between promise and peril is to have some kind of understanding of it. I think why, where we get into trouble with things like Yik Yak, we, we end up in these chase where it's like whack-a-mole and we just want to get rid of things because they're dangerous and there are these dangers, but it's only by having a real understanding of what a technology is, what a platform is, um, that we can, we can bring it in in a meaningful way, but we also don't need to be sort of chasing after each one, saying we can't have this around, this is dangerous. And that goes to any, then, and it touches on to whether it's bullying, whether it's our attention spans, uh, whether it is privacy concerns, but there's also tremendous benefits of things, if we can understand how to use things the right way. So it's both in terms of understanding, as you say, the nuance and how you can bring it into your classrooms and really understanding it in a, in a profound way, in a meaningful way. Uh, but also to avoid the fear, to avoid running from things, because once we start running from things and sort of this idea of blocking things, of finding the IP of a school and not letting a technology be there, just feels like it's a very, very dangerous road to go down because we have to run faster and faster because there will just be another app that comes up and another technology. And then we're not teaching students digital literacy and these technologies aren't going around and it becomes part of the ecosystem. It's part of the world that they're going to be in. And so I think the reason that we all need to be using these, and I, you know, I... Oh my God, I just, there, there are always new. I can't even keep up with Tumblr. Like, there's just, <laughs> there's just so much all the time <laughs> to stay on top of. But I think we need to, if for, you know, I think that the number one reason that we need to is because when we don't know it, we fear it. And it's not, we're not, we're doing a, 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 an immense disservice to students by fearing it uh, because then it just becomes that thing that they want that they can't have in school and and then we're not doing our job as educators. So I think that for me, the real reason to know things is to know the good and the bad, to be able to educate, A, using the, the benefits, but also um, to not make them those taboo things that aren't allowed in, that we're blocking, uh, that then we're not doing our jobs to educate, the, the literacy component to it too. Actually, that just reminds me of my one of my sons when they, they used to have those net nanny things, you know, where they would stop you going in and looking at stuff. So as soon as you put something like that up, it's an invitation to get around it, right? And that's and I remember him being quite young, actually coming back and saying, "Well, you know, if you do this and this and this, you get around that. And you can see all those sites, and you know, yeah." And you just set up, you just keep resetting the bar and and having the wrong kind of conversation. I agree. Yeah. So I, <clears throat> I just wanted to, to talk about that as well from the elementary perspective. Uh, there's a number of teachers I know, practicing teachers, who are very cautious about having Facebook's account, Facebook accounts, and they don't use Facebook because of the cautions that they've received from uh, ETFO and OCT. Uh, however, just because they don't have Facebook, I think uh, a number of them are brave enough to incorporate Edmodo, which is kind of a, a safe educationally focused equivalent mm -hmm. of Facebook in the in the classroom, especially suitable for elementary students. And they're, uh, I, I guess they're brave enough to incorporate it and let their students have that experience. And they, uh, a number of them learn from their students 
uh, how do you, how what the benefits of using a social media tool like Facebook in their classrooms. So I, I'm not so sure. I think that you ha- necessarily have to be familiar with the the technology. You, sometimes you don't even have to teach the students how to use it. They'll they'll figure out a lot about the the tools themselves. You just have to understand. I think the the cautions and the pros and cons of incorporating technology into your classroom and not, don't be afraid. Well, that's the thing, isn't it? It's the fear. So then the students can teach us to a certain extent and then after that we have to do things as well. Um, anybody want to ask a question yet? Yeah, great. Um, I'm, I'm really liking what I'm hearing here about the appropriate use of technology and using it meaningfully in the courses. I'm an administrator for the Peel Board and we have been incorporating technology. We are encouraging students to bring their own technology into the classrooms and we are finding that it, it has helped. It helps to engage the students. But one of the fears that, one of the things that I'm finding, what, what I'm experiencing as an administrator is that I'm, I'm finding slowly and slowly over time that students are lacking those social skills of interacting with one another on a on a face-to-face level we're we're seeing more and more inappropriate behavior and I'm wondering if some of this behavior is is due to the fact that they're now going to be um, on technology during the day and they're obviously on technology at night so there's never a break from this technology and I notice it even with my own kids. It's, it's you know, you, 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 I don't see them anymore. They're in the room like moles, and you have to be pulling them out away from their from their devices. So again, it's that balance. And I'm wondering if you can comment on that. And the other uh, the other thing I wanted to ask about was just the whole privacy piece, where we've we've experienced students who are creating fake accounts where they're saying inappropriate things to other people, and we cannot find who those kids are. We can't pinpoint it because it, the privacy piece doesn't allow us to. So those two things, I'd like some sort of comment. Okay, thank you. Anybody want to tackle one of those? Um, I was just talking. <laughs> I guess from my perspective, uh, I agree with your points. They're uh, really good points that uh, it, it is concern that as we uh, teach our young students how to um, or hopefully try to teach them how to engage uh, in a in a digital sense, that we take away from the engagement uh, face to face. I, I don't know that I have an answer to that because uh, it's not just in school. I mean, hopefully in school, there's still a lot of collaborative, uh, work that they'll do in, in classrooms and they'll have that component but there's no doubt about it that students even at lunchtime will uh, text each other and I don't know that we can we can solve that one as educators what what I do know we can do as educators is try to incorporate uh, social media into our classrooms and talk about uh, those uh, times when students say things that they might say to each other in the in the yard, and they say these things online, and they, they're, uh, there's much more um, meaning can be read into those types of comments, and they, they can actually have criminal uh, uh, repercussions. So I think anytime as educators, we can bring that up in the classroom uh, by working out a, a contract of what's appropriate use of technology in our classroom. I know a number of teachers that start the year off at the very beginning. What is appropriate uh, engagement online? How do we talk to each other uh, use it over social media? Sometimes they'll find teachable moments where they'll hear of an incident and they'll use it as an example of uh, what what should we do about something like this? What what went wrong here? What do you think this person meant? You know, there's inference. We talk about inference anyways uh, in our uh, literacy instruction. What what can we infer from what was said online? What might the person have meant? What well, what can we do to fix that? And I know that teachers who have incorporated that those methods of uh, those teachable moments, uh, incorporating into their regular classroom instruction um, every week and starting right from the very beginning, have noticed uh, much uh, better online behavior from their students. And I, I've know, I know of entire schools that have talked about uh, over a two-year period, uh, middle schools who have uh, taken a proactive way of 
uh, way of dealing with cyberbullying and and online interaction, they have uh, gone from uh, involving the police uh, more than a few times to involving the police not at all for online interaction. Hmm. Well, that's encouraging. Anyone else want to? Sure. Um, uh, yeah, actually, the the Peel Board in in our class where we've been teaching. Um, uh, online technologies and so forth. Peel board has been one of our favorite uh, subjects of discussion because because of the you know you bring bring your own device policy there, and the the kinds of challenges that that might introduce in the classroom. We've had a lot of discussions about that, and I think one of our um, I think oh I agree with you that there can be a problem. Students need to both learn how to interact with each other on a person to person basis, and they need to n n develop those social skills. Um, but also both face-to-face -face and online. We, they, we need to teach them both of those things. Um, th there have been different reactions in our class to the BYOD policy. Um, some feel that there are times when uh, devices should simply be put away and students should be expected to interact with each other on a face-to-face -face basis. Uh, uh, other people, and uh, another perspective I think is that um, we have to talk to our students about some of the risks associated with these devices. The fact that the student, they can be distractions when you're trying to study or when you're trying to concentrate. That they, uh, they can be alienated if you're alienating if you are trying to have a face-to-face -face conversation. So we educate them and bring them into the conversation as participants so they know for themselves what both the strengths and the risks are of these technologies and they can make wise choices on their own. Okay, thanks, Stephen. I, mean, I think we're, we're addressing a, a large societal issue, not just in the classroom. I think so much of our experience has become mediated. Uh, just last week, I was talking to a class and I said, you know, I, I can't guarantee a lot, but I can guarantee you that when you have children, they will laugh at the idea that you, like every 17 minutes or less, checked this thing and walked around and bumped into people and crossed the street without looking. They're going to laugh at you. You may think you're cool now, but it is, you know, my point being, it is an issue. And I said, your life probably isn't that important right now that you need to check your Facebook update every 17 minutes. Probably not. Maybe one or two of you, but <laughs> it's an addiction. And it's an addiction I have, um, not Facebook in this case, but we all do it. How many times have you been in the same room with someone who texts you? Or in the same house? Instead of calling, you know, honey, is dinner ready? It's like, honey, is dinner ready? Um, <laughs> because they don't come. Because they don't come. <laughs> they don't come. <laughs> um, the point being, the, the issues you raise span, you know, our entire culture. In the classroom, which is why I bring it up, I, with a grad class, I once said, and I've done this a couple times, I think I did it here uh, with a Jim Slaughter class, I said, everybody turn your phones off. I didn't mean lock them. I meant power them down. And sometimes you have to show someone how to power down their phone because they don't know how. And then we just sit there in silence and it gets really <laughs> uncomfortable. And then I ask them, how did you feel? And they felt totally disconnected from their world for just a couple of minutes. So again, you're raising issues that go far beyond what a teacher can do in the classroom. But if you're cognizant of this kind of behavior and this kind of mediated experience where I've been in faculty meetings, like I, I'll be sitting next to Ramona and she's doing six or seven different things while I'm doing six or seven different things and we're listening and, mm -hmm. and not. And, um, and then I'll get a text from someone on the other, just right across you know, God, can you believe how long this is going? <laughs> so um, we're all doing we're six all or guilty, seven other things. We're all guilty of it. And um, again, awareness helps you deal with it. I'm, I'm going to throw it now that you've thrown me under the bus. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> well, I said, well, I was doing right, six right, or seven. Right, right. It's all right. We all do this. Um, I'm going to just throw something else into the mix. I think that the conversation about technology in the classroom is, is so important. And... Uh, and, and I think what we can't lose sight of is the fact that adding technology isn't a step that we don't step back from. It, it, we're adding choice. 
we're not adding these tools because, you know, there's, there's a gun to our head. I mean, in some ways it feels like we are, but ultimately what we want to make sure that we're doing is adding choice, adding different ways of learning, different platforms for learning, that that mobile device may really have wonderful benefits for exploring environments, for connectivity, for location-based explorations, that, that, you know, group think in Google Docs has tremendous capabilities, that the like button, right? But what we want is choice. What we don't want to be is bound to our devices because we've now brought our computers into the classroom, so that's the only thing that we can do. Uh, and what I'm going to throw into the mix is if you look at interaction design and sort of look at trends, one of the trends that you see emerging, which I think you know is, is the one hopeful piece in all of this, is that there is this return of analog. And you see it either, you know, if you're a foodie, you see it in the 100-mile diet, if you're... Um, if you are interested, you know, if you're interested in Etsy culture, the bespoke movement, but it all is speaking to, you know, sort of what comes after remix, what comes after too much technology, uh, where it feels like it's everywhere all the time. The return of board games, of scavenger hunts, of card games, right? We're seeing this resurgence of analog as something that's really appealing. And I brought it up earlier, and I realized it was probably a totally obscure reference, but even the room escape. So the room escape are these puzzle experiences that are live and experiential, and they are, and, and, and they've become this, and one of the great, the fastest growing phenomenon in terms of entertainment, things that people do in their spare time. The reason I bring this up is that it's totally borrowed from the virtual experience of an online game. It's collaborative, it's puzzle-based, people are working together to solve problems. It's exactly why we want to bring technology into our classrooms. But what people have learned is that they enjoy that technology, they enjoy the group think, they enjoy solving problems together, but they also really enjoy being in a room with people and actually just connecting and solving those problems. And so I think I have found that some of my favorite classes and best classes have been when we've done those really collaborative, totally analog uh, exper uh, uh, um, uh, assignments or experiences that sometimes, because it is at the university level, will be two and a half hours long. Um, but I think we can't forget that uh, it is about choice. And part of the, I love what you're saying because I think, and I think you were touching on this too, but if we can dissect the allure of the digital experience, of the virtual experience, whether it is um, empowerment, whether it is connection, whether it is the group think, the puzzles, figure out what the allure of all of that is, but also don't lose the fact that there is this resurgence of the, the real. And I think bringing that into the class and sort of knowing that it is a trend doesn't hurt. So that's the, the little piece that I would throw into that, into that conversation also. And I think um, the word sort of that Ramona didn't say that everyone says is uh, things go viral, right? So thinking about how things go viral online, um, one of the things I like to do when I'm with a group of people sitting at dinner or something, uh, we put our phones away and we talk about something that is thought provoking, um, something that gets people critiquing, upset, frustrated. What are problems that we encounter that we've seen online? These are what these are the types of things people are sharing and the types of things that go viral. Talk about that. Don't just share it and like it and comment on it. Talk about it. How do we have these really engaging conversations that can go viral face to face? Um, and the room experience is fantastic. I think the idea of being able to problem solve face to face um, in a sort of more uh, planned out it's, it's fully designed for that experience, but you can have those as an ad hoc discussion um, at a dinner table over coffee. And it's thinking about how do we re-engage ourselves in that face-to-face? -face? What can I say that is thought-provoking that I can say that will get us all talking and not clicking the like button, um, not commenting or hashtagging, let's have this face-to-face. Wow, that's, you know, that's such an interesting idea because it's like we've had to rediscover what it means to talk to one another. But, th so that, that, but that sounds like a sort of a deep in social integration of what we call sort of gamification principles. I mean, that's, is, I mean, that's kind of what you're saying, really. But now that it's come sort of, in a sense, full circle, but it brings a different kind of structure to our social interactions. But it was derived from these um, online experiences. But, but that's really interesting. I, I like that. Cool idea. Um, anybody got some thoughts? Come join in. Thanks, guys. 
I'm interested in the relationship between technology and authority and the way in which technology allows, whether it's peer-to-peer -peer or even on the flip side, a more effective authoritarianism. Mm -hmm. I think it provides a gradient of changing our relationship with authority. So I'd be curious to hear the panel's thoughts on both how that applies to learning styles and the student's ability to choose the way they learn and the notion of a participatory curriculum. The idea that students would be able to not just choose the style that they want to learn, but actually literally choose what they want to learn. And I offer that under the context of disobedience. Because that's kind of what I was thinking about under the last person's question when kind of the breakdown of social cues and social abilities is also, uh, I think, coupled with how easy it is to dissent and how easy it is to be disobedient. And I'm watching this with my nephew who's in grade one, and the extent to which he absolutely despises school, but loves learning. And it's an interesting contrast that gets back to me that there is this notion of authority in terms of, especially in the education system. So I'm curious to hear the best. Okay, who wants to have a go at that? I'm only going to talk about a very small part of that. And okay. um, this is just in the context of us uh, designing online spaces. And uh, one of the things I think we, we realized very early on is that it's critical that students should have secure and safe ways of interacting with one another without the instructor knowing. Um, there, there needs to be ways that people can disagree without having to do so publicly or make statements with others without having to expose what they're saying to the entire class. This is what happens in regular classrooms. If you go to a classroom, you might you know, uh, pull up a friend aside, at, you know, at, at during break and, and say, well, I thought that was a lot of crap, you know, <laughs> you know, and that's often a good discussion to have, you know, and it, but, um, and you need to have that in online spaces too. So to, to that small extent that I'm touching your question, I think we have to replicate in these online spaces what we can do face to face. Okay. Anyone? Yeah. Steve. I mean, the ultimate authority in education, certainly at the university level, is the lecturer in front of 100 students or 600 students, the sage on the stage, which harkens back 600 years to there was one book, one person read it, and everybody else listened. And we haven't changed that much in 600 years. Um, so this idea that, that I brought up, I think, the, my uh, first go with the microphone, this idea that um, I am the authority and this is an information dump, and you will write it down and learn it, is, um, is a, something that I think we're all recognizing is of waning effectiveness. And the way I personally have started to deal with it is I'm not the authority in the room. I'm one of 101 authorities in the room. And I structure my curriculum so that they can start teaching themselves and construct their own knowledge, that they come in with a wealth of knowledge. They might not know the exact you know, the subject matter to the degree I do, but they, they have analogous situations, they have metaphorical situations, they come in with a knowledge base or funds of knowledge, which um, I can't remember which research paper I read that in. Um, so I give them the opportunity to build this knowledge themselves where I can go through the class and I'm thinking of a particular class with 130 students and I've got 22 groups and I, I can kind of mentor what's going on and my TAs can do that. But what starts happening is within their, their, their group is, is certain members of the group start mentoring other members of the group. They start majoring in a particular part of the curriculum. And, and so this is ad hoc knowledge that is being built and I'm not doing the teaching. They're doing the teaching. And, and, you know, we're talking about technology and, and I use that technology and allow them to use that technology in that environment. But that is, is recognizing that dynamic, that there's a lot of knowledge in the room and it's not all mine. And I use pedagogy, you know, these tools in my pedagogy to help that situation. I think what's really interesting, um, a piece of uh, another small piece of this is if we look at examples, um, the research talks a lot about Facebook because Facebook is such a text based environment and you can share so much. Um, but with the group functionality of it, 
teachers, a lot in higher ed at least, have been using it for discussions outside of the actual lecture hall. And what the studies are showing is that students actually don't want to be friends with their peers necessarily if they don't know them, nor do they want to friend their instructor. And the reason that this is happening, that's coming up, is that they don't want to feel judged other than based on what they are contributing to this educational experience outside of their profiles, their life that they've created on this on Facebook, their profile. They don't want instructors going to the profile and being like, well, if this kid was just drinking last night, what he's saying today, is it really worth any value if I've been engaging in extracurricular activities? Um, so there's this really interesting power struggle between students and, and instructors, student faculty relationships that Facebook allows you to visualize in, in the network and, and see how does this get dealt with and what types of feelings does this bring for students and for faculty. Faculty don't really want to necessarily be friends either for the same reasons. They don't want to feel judged by their students. And what it really highlights is that we are all human. We are all engaging in activities other than the ones that we are in the class, that we are in the classroom. And we each bring something, experiences, that can help inform these, which is extremely valuable to the learning. And in acknowledging that, then you've started to at least break down that authoritarian type um, structure or authoritative structure. So these are all conversations that need to happen and acknowledging that is, is key. Okay, thanks. I think, I think you're both right. Uh, I, I think that, that we'd be remiss to not sort of, I think there's a, I, I am very pro the, the positive uh, attributes of technology and bringing it into the class. But I, I think I, I think that there is a dark dark side to this too. I know that I remember the first year, I think it was four years ago now that I had a class that was on Twitter and it was lecture based. And after every class, it was five to seven, it was in the evening. And I, I remember after every class just feeling this anxiety before going to Twitter. And, and nothing was ever bad, but all of a sudden, you know, you talk about the fourth wall in, in film, but all of a sudden, we weren't in a private learning environment. We were, it, was, it became performative. We were in front of a stage. And there is something really special about a classroom that is four closed walls where people get to make mistakes. And I, and I know I often say to university students, like you're no longer in high school where you are striving to get an A or an A plus. Like don't wait till you're out in the industry to make mistakes, fall on your face. But you don't fall on your face when you're um, when you're performing for the world. And it, the same thing happens for professors that you, you know, you become so aware of the fact that you, that everyone's watching and everything's being judged and everything's being tweeted. And I, I think that that's a big part of that authoritarian discussion is that everything is being judged. And there's a consumer, um, you talk about affordances. I mean, I, I'm so pro technology and social media, but there's a very consumerist affordance to our social media whereby, you know, if you are paying for your university degree, all of a sudden there is a sort of authority that's paired with what you do. And, and I, I think we can't, uh, ignore this darker side that goes with the relationship shift that goes on, whether it is by opening up the, what the wall and not being in a safe space and what that means to making mistakes and having that freedom and having that, that, that space to play, uh, or whether it is in the, this, that dynamic between the student and, and kind of judgment. So um, I think there's a lot of positive, but I also think that there is tension right now because I think we don't necessarily always talk about it. Uh, we haven't certainly resolved it, but there are shifting dynamics between roles. There is this constant sort of, I can tweet this. And I think that's fantastic. On one hand, you know, mm -hmm. it, it makes everyone do their best work if they know that at any moment the rest of the world will know what's going on. Um, but it also does change the dynamic of sort of this really beautiful safe space for learning and, and making mistakes and, and, and play. That's a great point, actually. That's a really good, good one. Yeah. Did you want to? Uh, yeah. <clears throat> Just to follow on on the the risk-taking point that you're making, it's a good point. Um, 
There's been studies even in the K-12 space of how um, different countries handle risk-taking in the classroom. <coughs> and uh, in, in Ontario, at least, uh, it's, it's, it's a tough spot to be in as a teacher. <clears throat> you want to encourage your students to take risks, but you've also got to teach to the curriculum, and you also are very governed by assessment models. So uh, just in going back to the, I mean, so I, I'm not saying one's right or wrong. I, I, I agree that risk-taking is an important component to learning, and I would really like to see more of that happen in our classrooms. But I understand that there, there are other things that get in the way. But to go back to the point um, about technology and authority, uh, well, there's two points I just wanted to make. One, one about technology and authority is that I think we uh, have to teach our young students from an early age to be critical consumers of information. And uh, early on, um, students who start to do research will sometimes assume that everything that's on the internet that they come across is correct and believable. And uh, it's not really part of our curriculum today to be teaching our students to start questioning what they're reading. But uh, those our students are going to continue researching on the internet with more and more information than we've ever thought about dealing with ourselves. And that's an important thing that we have to think about is thinking about teaching them that uh, everything that's online is not the authority. And finally, to go back to the grade one student who um, dislikes school and maybe would like to have choice in what they're learning. Uh, I, I was thinking about a study James, well, James G. talks about students that were not doing very well in math uh, or young students, but they were doing very well. I think it was Pokemon or Yu-Gi-Oh. They knew amazing amounts of, uh, they had amazing amounts of knowledge about the um, calculation system, and yet they were struggling with simple uh, math problems and things like that. And, and so he proposed that the students would do well if they wanted to learn about it, if it was, if we were teaching them something they were interested in. And so I, I see more and more teachers in, in, in Peel Board for example, <laughs> that uh, are, are giving students choice, that the technology makes it easier to have an inquiry-focused uh, uh, program where you can let the students figure out what they're most interested in and still meet the curriculum needs and the uh, assessment criteria. So um, I agree that uh, it would be more engaging sometimes for students to have choice. More Pokemon math, <laughs> yes. Um, wh while we're on the subject of consumers, I'm going to ask a question that was sent to me by one of our faculty who couldn't come tonight, by Larry Benz, actually. And it's about um, the educational Im implications of what <clears throat> he describes as immaterial labor. Which I'll, um, So when you're on social media, um, there's, you know, that uh, users' preferences are always being sort of um, assessed. And um, you can, you know, and the, everything that we do online is being is being monitored, and advertising is is basically we're, we're providing immense amounts of information all the time, um, freely, uh, just by acting and acting in those spaces, and that gets used to benefit companies and other users. And um, um, so his his point is, what do you think the educational implications are of engaging with these sorts of um, environments when that's part of what's going on there, and it's not a voluntary thing. It's just it's a, a function of the of the use. Does anybody want to have a go at that? Okay, so I'm going to tackle that question or that comment from one perspective. That it's not, although this seems to be commercialization and, and selling information and data to large companies that use it for marketing purposes to make more money. Um, this isn't the worst thing that could happen. I think that, and I think this for one reason, is that there is a lot of value in the data mining of types of information that we are putting out there if they are education um, or purpose for education that you can learn a lot about a user. You can learn a lot about where you are struggling with this type of data as well. Where does a student need help? Maybe they keep reading the same thing over and over and eventually algorithms um, as programmers and education uh, researchers keep working together, we learn how to identify all this type of information. And so it is the, what I think is the beginning of 
maybe some people consider it Pandora's box, but also a lot of um, potential to help people learn better because it's tailored for them. And in mining all of this data, iTunes does this, right? They recommend things to us based on what we have purchased in the past. That is valuable. Maybe I'm learning something because I'm listening to a particular audiobook that is related to a course that I'm taking and I am then starting to read other things that might be of interest to me. That is an absolute, absolutely valuable tool of making a user aware of possibilities that they didn't necessarily know existed, but a computer algorithm identified it for them. So there are benefits there. And I acknowledge that there is a dark side in that marketing aspect, but there is a ton of potential as well. Yeah, uh, it sounds like one of Larry's questions. It's, it's, <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a great question. It's um, and I I think it's a I think it's an issue. Um, I'm personally not in favor of people using uh, environments like Facebook uh, or maybe Twitter, but but even so, I mean, where where user data, student data is is compiled and goes back into the profit making of the company. Now there are good alternatives. There are, as you mentioned, uh, Edmodo. Uh, uh, there are environments where the data is protected. There are, there are educational environments that you can use. And of course, there's an awful lot of open sourcing going on uh, where you're still getting the, uh, the benefits of crowdsourcing, you know, the bringing together of information, but on, without the commercial side of it. So um, that would be my, my solution to it. Anybody else? Wait. Okay. All right. You wanted a question? Uh, as a high school teacher, I would like to ask a question about the uh, distracting aspect of the social media. Because some days ago, I, I want to talk about uh, one of my interesting experience about social media. Because some days ago, uh, one of my friends asked a question on social media about like, could you recommend some uh, useful app for learning English because we're international student. And another of my friends uh, gave a best answer he said the best app I have used, uh, I have ever used is called Power Off. So that means if you <laughs> just, yeah, turn off your, like, any devices, and then that's the best way to help you to learn English. So that me makes me remind, like, um, there are, of course, a lot of useful apps for us to learn English. But then that's a trade-off because that's, the device is so distracting. Like, I would like to go on all the news on the website and my Facebook and then start to learn English if I have time left. So as a teacher, I would like to know if there, there's like any like research to provide us strategies or criteria or benchmarks to, to help us to decide if that's the proper time to uh, introduce the device into into classroom because I believe I'm a, an adult and teenagers or even younger students, do they have enough like self-disciplined ability to, to use the device properly? Thank you. I, I can't really speak for high school or K to 12. Um, if you attempt to eliminate all distraction, well, you're going to have a, a very long time doing it because you can't eliminate all distraction. I went to undergrad when there were no computers. I still managed to distract myself in boring lectures. I could read a novel. I could doodle. I could pass notes. I could daydream. I mean, there are distracting events that occurred and, and continue to occur uh, pre-technology, post-technology. What... Um, what I rather think about doing, and it's a book I read by Nassim Taleb called Anti-Fragile, is, is how do I create an anti-fragile environment where there's a bit of chaos, a bit of distraction in the room that actually benefits. It's like shaking a snow globe. It gets better when you shake it, whereas a crystal goblet is fragile. So trying to, to create total non-distraction is fragile because you can't 
achieve it. If you tell everyone in a mass lecture to shut their computers, someone's going to be doing a thigh uh, texting. You know, someone's going to have their computer open. Unless you want to use your TAs as cops, um, it's a very, what I call a fragile situation. So you try to make it anti-fragile. You try to, you know, have a little hubbub, a little distraction. But if you create a methodology, a curriculum that uses these devices, then you'll have some distraction, but hopefully it makes things better. I, I was recently assessed because I'm tenure track at, at uh, RTA, and I have a, this professor came into a class with 130 students, and afterwards he said to me, I was looking at all the computers, of which there were probably 80 of the 130. He said, I saw three that weren't taking notes. So I guess I was doing a good job at that time, keeping them distracted with what they were supposed to be doing. And I think that's your job as an educator, is to keep them involved and engaged. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't have an answer to that other than to say that a number of educators think that if we start teaching our students earlier about self-regulation and appropriate use of technology in schools, and uh, they see it uh, in school for primarily for learning instead of right now that some people propose that students when they're in school with a device are so used to using it for social connections that they it's a it's it's work for them to remember that this device is here in my classroom to help me learn but as we start earlier that that uh, classroom distraction may go away. I don't know if it will or not. Uh, again, uh, I mentioned the contracts before. If you could talk to your students about what what's acceptable, how do you feel if you're in a classroom and some of your classmates are, are uh, on texting each other? Is that fair to all of us? We're all learning together. Can we, should we come to some kind of agreement asking them for a type of buy-in to the, um, the classroom environment and the learning environment and whether it's appropriate to do that. And there may still, even if the whole class agrees that we're here to learn, we shouldn't really be doing this, let's not do it, there will be people that are distracted, as you said. There would be even without technology. But I, I hope and it's believed that maybe as we start to teach these uh, this this way earlier that it will just become ingrained as well in the students. Yeah, uh, there are a couple of studies that have looked at uh, the use of techno uh, use of laptops in lecture halls, and uh, one of them found that uh, that laptops are are, di are a distraction. And in controlled studies, they found out that the condition without the laptops, uh, the students retained more and did better on the tests. An another study looked at the use of laptops to take notes, so no distraction, no going to Facebook, but the use of laptops to take notes versus taking notes by hand, and they found in that study that the people who took notes by hand did better. Um, so, uh, so th I mean, these are, these are real issues, but my, my feeling, and I think it's very similar to the ones that have been expressed here, is the goal here isn't necessarily to, to mandate a uh, certain use of technology or not, but rather to uh, and, and get, again, engage the student in a discussion of these issues so they're aware of when they are distracted themselves and they can self-moderate. I think that's something that they need more than anything else going forward. I think one of the things that you um, touched on in your question about English language learning, that's very unique and, and just in general, not necessarily English language learning, but language learning through the use of technology, that is becoming a lot easier for people to learn how to identify words, build up their vocabulary in particular languages, practice something that they may have lost. So if I have been, I learned French for 13 years, but I don't speak it every day, to hear it on my smartphone and to actually listen keeps me up with that language. And what's very important is that when you are learning a language, it makes you very uncomfortable when you have a fear of saying something wrong. And to have the technology provide students comfort with knowing that, oh, I have some, a quick resource to access that can teach me how to pronounce the word, what the word means. And there are 
really valuable points in time when that technology is a key player in that learning experience for students because it is what reduces their anxiety about learning a new language. So it's understanding that fine balance between when is it something that brings comfort because it is immediate, um, they get an answer, whereas maybe you can't be with every single student at the, t the same time and to engage as a group may be uncomfortable for some people. So it's knowing when to integrate it, but there is so much potential with language learning that puts individuals at ease that it has now become such a powerful tool to, to use. I have to just finish up a little bit about that too because, um, uh, yeah, I think actually language learning is where there's been the most research uh, that's connect, used technology in, in language learning. But, um, I, I, but I think the big, it's been for different kinds, not necessarily for, uh, for speaking and com communication, and that's a, an, an important part. But um, last, well, I was in Brazil not long ago, and um, I don't speak Portuguese, and it was amazing. I can download these amazing apps that will just pronounce things for you. And so I could march into a store, having practiced a little bit, and, and know that I was actually saying it properly. And this, was a, this is huge, you know. So I, I think we can... <laughs> Um, you know, I think there is a lot of potential for that. It's, it's, but it's, it, it, it's true. It's not being distracted by the, by all the other bits and sort of going back to the the part that you need to practice with the language, which is usually the speaking. I think that's true for for everybody learning a language. Um, good. Yeah. Would you like to? It's just so we can get it on the on the tape. Thank you. So thank you very much for the very interesting discussion so far. Um, so I'd like to speak as a, as a teacher, as an educator, as a parent, and as a user. For me, I guess all the things that you have said make, make sense, perfect sense. You know, there are trade-offs and there are also um, important affordances in using these uh, technologies. But I guess my biggest concern is uh, what do we do with the issue of addiction? Because whatever you do, you know, you can talk to these kids, you can... Um, you know, get them to understand the arguments and how you could use technology and why you wouldn't use it on certain occasions. But addiction is more like a psychological thing. It's addiction like other things, um, you know, like drugs or alcohol or other types of habits. And I'm not sure how we can get to the point where we, um, you know, it's not only rational, it's emotional as well, and the addiction kind of gets to you. How do we deal with those cases which are very frequent and which um, I see it for myself as well, it's both for adults and for kids, that we get addicted with things. It's very hard, especially when you're young, to kind of break away from those habits and spend time and find balance. I think for me, balance is very important. So find time to do other things in your life as well. And uh, especially with uh, younger kids, then you have this social um, pressure as well. So it's not just that, uh, you know, we have distractions and we've had distractions in different learning environments uh, from, you know, ages ago, but um, you also have this social pressure that doesn't allow you to just cut off these, you know, negative experiences of being always online and not doing anything else in your life. Thanks. I, I think that's a fantastic question because it is what everybody is dealing with today. It's the, do you have a compulsion to wake up at five o'clock in the morning like I do to check your emails and, re and reply to people that emailed you last night at midnight because they went to bed late. It's, I recognize that I have a problem with that, right? So, I mean, that's but it's the first is, step first on the road step, to right? recovery. First step is acknowledging it. But it's the, the key there is that there is this awareness that every individual has to have. It, it was the same problem with TV. Are children watching too much TV? Then it's video games. Are children playing too many video games? All they're doing is locked up in their room playing video games. Now it's they, everyone pulls out their phones and now we're playing Candy Crush and we're spending money on Candy Crush. We need to realize these are all experiences that are designed to make us addicted. So in understanding that, then we can only begin to realize that we need to be just more self-aware 
more aware of how connected we are in that moment, understanding that a feeling of going out and playing soccer with a group of friends might bring you a lot more joy than sitting and playing Candy Crush in your room for five hours, but you didn't necessarily realize that. So it's recognizing that because we are so emotionally invested and become so emotionally connected to these devices, and part of that is because of the communication that we have with individuals through them, um, that these face-to-face -face analog experiences are absolutely key, but knowing when we are there, we should be physically present. And the fantastic thing is when I look out into the crowd, I don't see people sitting here there and playing with their phones or laptops. Everyone is engaged. But understanding that we are all present and teaching that you have to be present is another learning experience. And it is difficult, but it takes time. And a parent, a child, we have to go through this um, uncomfortable feeling of what does it feel like to actually be here in the now? and not just sit and take pictures of the food I'm going to be eating because it just got delivered to my table. Um, but what does it smell like? What colors are these foods? Realizing that our senses are, shouldn't just be focused on a, on a screen. Sorry. I, I have a wonderful story. It's one of the most poignant anecdotes that has just stuck with me and it, it doesn't add any advice, but I think it's just really <laughs> worth adding. <laughs> um, when I, I Previously was at Frontline, I worked on a project called Digital Nation, uh, which dealt with a lot of these issues. And one of the big components of that project, it was one of the very first uh, projects that used a user-generated campaign because we had you know, all of the great experts on learning, on uh, attention span, on all sorts of components of digital life, military, really everything. But also uh, what was really exciting, and this was early days of YouTube, was we can hear from real people. And so many stories that we now take for granted, as you say, keeping your phone out at the dinner table, were taboo, especially, and again, as you say, when it comes to putting your face on a video on YouTube, that's a really high barrier of entry. It was a lot we were asking of people, but over 18 months, people started sharing their stories. And one of the ones that will always stay with me that speaks to this trade-off and I think sort of encapsulates this whole conversation was a woman who uh, had a corporate job and a Blackberry. This also dates the story. And she would always, you know, she, could, she, was, she worked past her kids' soccer games. Her kids' soccer games were at 4, and she got off work at 5.30. And all of a sudden, with her BlackBerry, she now could go to her kids' soccer games. Um, and, uh, but there was this one time, and she was at the soccer game, and she was writing to her boss on email. And she looked up and realized that her kid had just scored the winning goal in the game. But she had missed it. And her kid was looking at her and realized that she had missed it and wasn't paying attention. And... As she related the story back to me, she said, um, you know, previously I wouldn't have been able to be at that game, but when we were at the dinner, dinner table, he told me, and I was engaged, and I was looking at his face as he was telling me the story, and so even though I wasn't there in the moment, I was fully engaged for the experience of him telling me, whereas sort of being there but not being present because of my device, uh, and him realizing that I hadn't missed it, I couldn't say, tell me all about it. Like, that moment had been lost, and, and so it's this incredible bargain and social bargain and emotional bargain and I, I feel like that has encapsulated the battle that we all deal with to this day that we're all con continuing to struggle with in that yes it's incredible that we can be physically present but we're emotionally maybe or, or, or psychologically not always present and it is like I and I, I again I, I, I don't offer anything with it other than I feel like it, it's just um it's so, such an archetypal tale of where we're at right now. So I, I think it's, it really is a challenge in terms of ba balancing what, what being present means, what being fully engaged means. And it's definitely a conversation that I think we need to have at all, at all ages. I, I just want to add to that uh, as a parent too. I, I, I'm also concerned about uh, online, the online time of my, my children. But uh, just to look at a positive, um, in schools, if we can uh, do some more, uh, focus a little bit more on creating online. So there's there's lots of opportunities. I mean, even even building in in simple tools like Minecraft. If we can uh, start to engage our young students in uh, creating YouTube videos and uh, building uh, together with other students in Minecraft and uh, working. Uh, to create instead of just consuming. I think that we're uh, 
preparing them for the world that they're going to be working in when they uh, finish school. So I think that's very important. I've heard stories, I don't know if it's true, I've heard stories that certain some companies have found value in, in people who have applied for jobs that have had experience in game uh, environments like World of Warcraft because they've had some experience uh, leading teams, uh, working collaboratively, and um, the employers have found that to be valuable in an employee. I don't know if it's true. It sounds like it might be, but um, I do think, though, if we could, uh, you know, turn uh, the online screen time desire of many young people into not just consuming but also producing, um, that maybe we are we can continue to prepare them for the world that, in which they're going to be working. It's true. Yeah. It is true. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, it's, it's true. true. <laughs> okay, I'll Just to add a, a small comment, not to offload responsibility, but it does start at the home. And I wish it had started at my home because my kids are addicted um, to online gaming. Um, but it does start at the home. It, 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 takes, it takes a village, right? We're just part of it. And I don't want to feed the addiction, and that's what I was talking about before. So if I can use these tools constructively, um, I do. And I think it's really important also to teach mindfulness to, you know, and that gets away from the technology or maybe, I, I'm not sure how you use technology and being mindful at the same time because it's a mediated experience, but to have them in the moment, like to recognize that, that they're so distracted that what can I do in the classroom to have them completely, at least for a moment in the present. And, and to teach that whole person to be mindful of what's going on right now. Um, again, an anecdote, people who take picture or take video of their kid's entire birthday aren't at the birthday. And when they look at it later, they go, wow, I wasn't really there because I wasn't present in the moment. So as, as great as it is to use these tools, I think you have to also be mindful of mindfulness in the classroom. I think that's actually a really nice point for us to uh, stop on, as it's six o'clock. And so I really want to thank our panel. Um, please give them a round of applause. And thank you to all of you for coming. Um, it was really, really interesting and thought-provoking questions. So thanks very much. <laughs>